Good morning, Village Church. It's good to be with you. If we haven't met, my name is Scotty James. I'm uh, one of the pastors here. It's time to get into the word. Oh, quick shout out. I want to say hi to uh, Tutu, my little son, Stefan, Shay Shay Tay Tay, Steph. My son, one of my sons broke his collarbone. So he's at, he's at home. So I just want to say what's up to him. All right, let's get into the word. If you have a Bible, let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Let's get down to business, Matthew 6. Verse 25, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. If you don't have a Bible, we have some in the back. If you lift up your hand real quick, we'll have an usher bring one to you. Also, you should have a bulletin, and on the bulletin, there should be the main text of the day. I want to encourage you to have that because we're going to be circling some things on there as we follow along. Matthew 6. If you're using one of our Bibles, that's page 457. Are we there? All right. Let's do it. It says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will drink. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Mm -mm Mm-mm-mm. Easy to read. Hard to do. If you've been with us for a while, we've been going through what it means to walk in the spirit, what it means to live in relationship, in connection to our Father. Life in the Spirit is really all about living the Christian life the way it's supposed to live. And that begins with us first understanding our identity. Your identity, I've said this many weeks, your identity is what shapes your reality. And so what that means is that if you don't understand who you are, you're not going to live the way you should be living. It's like what I said with dogs. When, When dogs try to lay eggs, that means they're misunderstanding who they are. When a dog thinks it's a bird, it, it, it tries to lay an egg. But when a dog understands what dogs do, when a dog understands who he is, he'll do what dogs do. He'll bark. He'll chase cats. He'll do the things that dogs do. And when the children of God misunderstand who they are, they end up living like children of this world. They live contrary to their identity. They live in a, in a false reality, so to speak. And in the scripture we just read, there was a reality that Jesus unpacked that is ours, if you're God's child, based on who your father is. So take out your notes. I want to encourage you to underline a few things. All right. In verse 26, Jesus says, look at the birds. I want to encourage you to underline, look at the birds in your notes. Verse 26, look at the birds, underline that. He goes on to say later on in verse 26, he says, your heavenly father feeds them. Underline that. Your heavenly father feeds them. Look at the birds. Your heavenly father feeds them. And then later on in verse 30, Jesus says, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field. Underline, God clothes the grass of the field. Three things. Look at the birds. Your heavenly father feeds them. God clothes the grass of the field. What Jesus is doing, Jesus here is revealing a reality that flows from God's identity. So if I asked you, who is God? Okay, let's say I'm just some guy on the street. Hey, who is God? What would you tell me? Okay, he's loving. What else? Who, what is God's identity? Is it? Excellent. So if, if you were to have a succinct definition, who is God? God is the creator, sustainer, redeemer, and authority of all things. He's the creator, meaning he made everything you see. That's God. But he's also the sustainer. He's the one who holds all things together. He's the redeemer, meaning he, he's the one who has made right everything that's been made wrong in this life. 
And he's also the authority. He's the one who's in charge of everything. So that is who God is. And because of his identity, there's a reality that flows from that. Because he's the creator sustainer, the reality is he's the one who provides for all things. He provides for the birds. He clothes the grass. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45 says that it's him who causes the sun to rise and to set. And the Bible says in Matthew 5, 45 as well that it's him who brings rain upon the earth. His identity as God has a reality that comes from that. He provides for all things. And so Jesus is revealing the identity of God, and then he's connecting that to his children. Okay, go back to your notes. Look at the connection here. In verse 25, he says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Circle that in verse 25. Do not worry about your life. This is the reality that flows into your life because of who your father is. Look at verse 27, or sorry, verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? Circle, why do you worry? There's a reason we're doing this underlying and circling. I'm trying to emphasize something. I'm trying to move us past just listening to content, and move us into experiencing something we should be experiencing. Look at verse 31. So what? Do not worry, circle it. In verse 31, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Verse 34, therefore what? Do not worry. Circle it again. Do not worry. So I want you guys to do the work here. Because of who God is and because of your connection to him as father, what is the reality that you should be experiencing? Do not worry. Do not worry. Because God is your father, you don't have to worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink what you will wear, because God is your father and he feeds the birds and he clothes the grass and he cares more about you than he does those things. So surely he will take care of you as well. This passage is about God's identity and the reality that belongs to us as his children. And then Jesus takes it a step further and he gives you a picture of what it looks like when you're not living according to your identity. Go back to verse 31. Don't worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. Circle that. Pagans run after these things. Pagans run after these things. So Jesus is saying that pagans are overly consumed with material things. What they'll eat, what they'll drink, what they'll wear. Pagans. You guys know what pagans are? What are pagans? Pagans are people who are not God's children. In its simplest form, that's what a pagan is. So when you live life overly consumed, overly fearful about the things of this world, what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, Jesus says you're living like a pagan. That's not meant to bring judgment or condemnation or shame. I bring this to bring awareness. If you're fearful and overly consumed with material things, that's not who you are, per the scripture. It's not who you're made to be. That's not the reality that is yours because of who your, who your father is. And this applies to physical protection as well, not just earthly material things. Okay, flip over to Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. Or write it down, Matthew 10, 29. Page 460, if you have one of our Bibles. It says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Jesus is saying, look, the most insignificant of birds can't die and fall to the ground apart from God being involved or God understanding or God seeing it. And the very hairs on your head are numbered. You're much more valuable than that. You don't have to worry about your physical protection. God cares for you. So to sum all of this up, you might say that the children of God are safe in the hands and the plans and the provision of their father. That is the reality that is yours because of who your father is. But, everyone say but. But there is a spiritual battle seeking to prevent you from experiencing this. you got to understand that. You live in a spiritual world. It's not just what you can see. There's an unseen world 
There's a real enemy that you have, and the enemy's objective is to prevent you from experiencing what you should be experiencing. Satan wants you to live like a pagan. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to live life fearful and afraid and anxious, worried about the things of this life. And if he can get you to believe lies or adopt patterns of thinking that contradict the reality that you should be experiencing, he can get you to live like a pagan. He can prevent you from living in the fullness that God has for you. Satan really has two goals. One is to turn you from God. That's his greatest goal. He wants to get you to turn from God. If he can't do that, then he'll get you to live like you don't belong to him. He'll get you to live like a pagan. He'll get you to live in a, in a false reality. And much of this is connected to our mind, how we think, the patterns of thinking that we have, the lies that we believe. That's what really drives all of our behavior. Now, a few weeks ago, we started getting into this. And we looked at a, a core belief that, if adopted by us, leads us to live contrary to who God made us to be. And that belief was, I'm not safe. So simple, so subtle. But when you live under that mindset that you're not safe, you're not going to live the way God called you to live. You can live afraid. You're going to be overly consumed about your life. And there's a couple other core beliefs or patterns of thinking that I want to reveal to us today that if we adopt, we're not going to live in the fullness that God has for us. So flip over to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus 16, verse 1. All right, Exodus 16, are we there? Page 34, if you're using this Bible. Say amen if we're there. Okay. It says, The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community had grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out to this desert to starve this assembly to death. All right, let's give some context here. The Israelites just came out of Egypt. They were in Egypt for 400 years as slaves to Pharaoh. And then God brought them out with great signs and wonders. These people had experienced the hand of God move in a way that no people past, present, or really future has, 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 has ever witnessed. I mean, they witnessed God send plagues of frogs plagues of boils, plagues of gnats and locusts. They witnessed God send hailstorms upon Egypt. They witnessed God turn water into blood. They, they witnessed God part the Red Seas. I mean, they saw the hand of God move like no one has ever seen before. And then a few days later, here they are grumbling, complaining, whining, panicking, acting like pagans, just like Jesus just said. Worried about what they will eat. Worried about the things of their life. What you're witnessing is an identity crisis. That's really what's going on here. They're afraid they're going to starve to death. That's what's going on in their mind. They're afraid they're going to starve to death because they don't understand who they are and who their father is. That's the deeper thing going on here. So let's see how God responds. Verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Skip ahead to verse 17. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. All right, pause there. So they start complaining, and what did God do? He provided. Right? He, he fed them. He's a good dad who fed his whiny, complainy children. We're hungry. We haven't eaten in 15 minutes. We're going to die. So God, like a good dad, feeds him. But he tells him one thing, look, don't save any till morning. I'm going to provide fresh bread for you every day. Don't 
save it till the morning. Let's see how they respond. Verse 20. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it till morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Did they listen? No. Kept some overnight. Now we could easily say, well, this happened because they lacked faith. True. They lacked faith. But I want to go deeper than just they lacked faith. If you were counseling them, how would you counsel them? Would you say, hey, just, just have faith next time? No, there, there's a deeper thought pattern going on in their minds right now that's leading them to disobey God. So I want to talk about that do, uh, uh, thought pattern because if we don't identify it and we adopt it unknowingly by us, we're going to do the same thing they did. We're going to end up not trusting in our father the way that they failed to trust in their father. So there's a belief system, a thought pattern that they had adopted that was leading them to, to, to disobey God. And this was the thought pattern. Right, write this down. I won't have enough. Again, sounds so subtle. I won't have enough. That core belief is driving the Israelites to disobey God. I won't have enough. They don't believe that their needs are going to be met. They don't believe that God will provide for them. And so that core belief leads them to disobey God and keep some till the morning. The reality was they would have enough because God was their father and God always provides for his children and he always provides for himself, for himself. But they didn't understand that. So that lack of understanding of who their father was and who they were in him led them to live contrary to their identity. And to take it a step further, they had what's called a scarcity mentality. I talked about this a couple weeks ago. A scarcity mentality is this belief that resources that you need to live are limited and hard to come by. And so food is limited and opportunities are limited and relationships are limited. And when you believe that, you are going to live in fear regarding resources. You're going to live scared. You're going to live saving stuff you don't necessarily need to save. You're going to be afraid to be generous to other people. Because that core belief is driving how you view the world. And the same thing happens to us. When we believe that we won't have enough to do what God wants us to do, we're going to do the same thing. This is what this looks like. I don't have enough money to obey God in this way. Or I can't do that. I won't have enough energy. Or I can't do that. I don't have enough capacity. Or we can't do that. We don't have enough people. It goes on and on and on. And all of those beliefs contradict what it means to be a child of God. If it's God's plan, you will have enough. Now, doesn't mean that, that you'll have enough for what you want to do, but you will absolutely have enough for what God wants you to do. So rather than a scarcity mentality, the people of God need to have a, what I call a, a kingdom mentality when it comes to resources. We need to have our mindsets regarding resources shaped by the kingdom of God. And so this is what a kingdom mentality is all about. Let's write this down. It's a few things. A kingdom mentality believes that God is the provider of all. That's the core belief of a kingdom mentality. It is God who provides for you. God is the provider of all. And so if God is the provider of all, someone with a kingdom mentality will see resources as unlimited. If, if God's providing it, it's unlimited because God's not broke. Right? God's not on a tight budget. Do you realize that? God's not short on change. God is not limited in his resources. And so when, when you adopt a kingdom mentality, your approach to resources will be that. Now, does it mean God gives you unlimited resources? I want to keep putting that in front of us. Does it mean because God's a provider of all and, and resources are unlimited in him, does it mean you should be frivolous and wasteful with things? That's, the, that's an immature application of that truth. But it does mean that if you are someone who sees resources as scarce, you are likely leaving God out of the equation. You are likely failing to understand that it's God who provides and that his power is abundant. So a kingdom mentality sees resources as unlimited because God's a provider of all. Here's a second piece of a kingdom mentality you should write down. God always provides for himself. Look at this a couple weeks ago. God's a provider of all and God always provides for himself. Meaning, if it's his plan, he's paying. Always. If it's his idea, he will fund it. Remember, the Israelites coming out of Egypt, it was God's idea. It was God's plan. And so he provided for them. He's the one who brought Moses to deliver them. He's the one who brought the power to destroy the Egyptians and the plagues. He's the one who parted the Red Sea. 
And now he was going to take the initiative to make sure that they were fed and that they made it to the promised land. He would see to it, but they failed to understand who their father was and the reality that should flow into their life. And so they ended up acting like pagans, worried about things that they should not be worried about. And for us, when it comes to us walking by the spirit, we need to adopt a kingdom mentality as well. Understanding that God is our provider and that God always provides for himself. He always funds his plans. Right now, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 7 to 8. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 to 8. It says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. God is able to bless you abundantly. Why? Because God is the provider of all things. And because God is the provider of all things, you will have all you need at all times, in all seasons, to do every good work that he has called you to do. That's a kingdom mentality right there. Okay, write down 2 Corinthians, oh, skip ahead to verse 10 of that. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10. Now he, talking about God, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. God is, Paul is touching on the fact that God is your provider. You will have enough to do what he has called you to do. If it's God's plan, he's paying he always provides for himself. But here's where it gets a little sticky and a little bit hard and uncomfortable, and I already alluded to it. God always provides for his plans, but he does not always provide for your plans. That's tough to swallow, but it's the reality. You will always have enough to do what God wants you to do. You may not always have enough to do what you want to do. God's provision is connected to his ideas. It's not always connected to, to our ideas. And sometimes we might want good things, we might want to do this or to be this or to have this or to serve God in this way or to live here or to have this role. There's nothing wrong with having desires. It doesn't mean you're selfish and evil. You can have desires, but it does mean that those desires have to take a backseat to what, 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 what God wants. If you're doing your part, which is a whole sermon in itself, if you're doing your part and the provision hasn't come, you need to understand that it's not God's plan, or maybe it's not God's plan in the moment, and you need to rest in that. You need to surrender to that. Because if you don't, what will happen is you will start to become controlling. You will start to, to try to focus on God's part. You'll try to force things. You'll get yourself in tough situations because you're not resting in God's provision. You're not surrendering to his plan, and you want your plan to happen, and you're just going to make it happen by white-knuckling it and just doing what you got to do. This is exactly what happened with Abraham and, and Sarah. Right, 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 right down Exodus, uh, no, Genesis 16. Genesis 16, verses 1 to 5. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. Genesis 16. It says, now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave girl named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. And so, Abram, and so after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. And when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Abraham and Sarah had enough to do what God wanted them to do, but they had their own agenda. God wanted them to have this child later, but they wanted that baby now. I want this baby now. And so what they did is they tried to control the situation. We're going to make up our own plan. We're going to start doing God's part. And when they're doing that, they screw everything up and they start living contrary to their identity. I want to encourage you, don't put your assumptions on God. Sometimes you have assumptions on what you need or what others need, and you put those on God, and that's just stay away from that. Example, 
My child needs this for their well-being. For them to grow into who they need to be, this needs to happen. Okay? Have you done your part to make it happen? Hypothetically, yes. Has it happened yet? No. Then they don't need that for God's plan. They might need it for your plan, but they don't need it for God's plan. At least not in the moment. And God's plan is better. The church, the church should have this ministry. Look, it says in the Bible we should be doing this. Okay? Has the church hypothetically done their part? Just, yeah, just theoretically. Okay. Well, has God provided the resource and the people to do it? Well, no. Well, then I guess the church shouldn't be doing that right now. When you don't surrender to God's plan, what happens is you try to force stuff like Abraham and try to control stuff. And what you end up doing is you start messing stuff up. You got to rest in his provision. You got to surrender to that. So on both ends, when God leads us to do something, we've got to trust that we will have enough. But also, if it's not happening or something's not happening that we desire, we also have to be able to say, you know what? If I'm doing my part and it hasn't happened, it's either not God's plan or it's not his plan yet. I need to rest and surrender to that. Difficult, difficult, but it's life-giving. Let's go to Luke chapter 12. Let's look at another misguided belief that will lead us to live contrary to how we should be living. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. If you have one of our Bibles, it's page 491. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Are we there? All right. It says, someone in the crowd said to him, talking about Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed you a judge and arbiter between, between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And then I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat and drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Listen, we need to really take this to heed, take heed to this parable. I was talking to someone earlier and I said, I I think this is one of the more overlooked parables in the scripture in our culture. A guy gets a bunch of crops. He makes a bunch of money off of it. And so he decides with this money, I'm going to build bigger barns to store more of my crops and I'll take life easy. And God condemns this behavior. God's not not having it. Now we could easily just focus on the behavior. But when you focus on behaviors and you don't get to the root of stuff, you just settle for behavior modification. You're not going to experience inward transformation. And so if you were to peel back the layers of this parable, what you'll see is a thought process, I believe. There's a thought process leading this man to behave in this way. There's a, there's a core belief that's driving him to behave in this way, and we have to be aware of it, otherwise we'll fall into the same category and live displeasing to God as well. So here's the thought pattern that's driving this man. Write it down. What I have is mine. That's driving his behavior. What I have is mine. That's what leads him to do what he did. Now, this is a parable, and the point of the parable isn't to unearth an earner mentality, but I think if you peeled back the layers of this sort of thinking and, and this sort of behavior, what you'll find is an earner mentality would lead someone to, to, to live or, 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 or act like this. If you don't remember from a few weeks ago, an earner mentality approaches resources from the standpoint of what I have is earned. I have because I earned it, or I have because I worked for it. Okay, In this parable... This man's ground yielded a harvest, which means he's a, he's a farmer of some sort. And the harvest was a result of his work. So he has earned resources in some way. And so he takes these resources that he's earned, and he says, I'm going to build bigger barns for myself to hold more of 
my resources because I believe what I have is mine to spend and it's my right to use it however I want because I earned it. And that line of thinking, per the scripture, is displeasing to God. Why? Because it left God out of the equation. This guy sees himself as the provider of his resources and himself as the one who has authority to spend it how he wants. He has an earner mentality. Instead of an earner mentality, we have to have a a kingdom mentality when it comes to resources. Here's the next core belief of a kingdom mentality. This is what a kingdom mentality says regarding resources. What what, What I have belongs to God. That's kingdom mindset. What I have, it actually doesn't belong to me. It actually belongs to God. When you understand that God is your provider and God is your supplier, you start to realize that what you have belongs to him, not to you, and he has graciously given it to you for his plans, not just for your own personal plans. Let's look at this in the scripture. Write down 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 13, page 537 in our Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 13. First Corinthians, first Corinthians 6, verse 12, it says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. Listen, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Skip ahead of verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Paul's talking about how our bodies are supposed to be used, and he's using the context of sexual immorality. And he's saying, don't use your body to gratify your sinful desires. Why? Because it doesn't belong to you. It's not your body to do whatever you want with it, to act how you want, to dress however you want, to sleep with whoever you want. That's not why you have your body. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the Lord, and it's meant to honor him. He's talking about ownership here. He's talking about how, how the very thing I said, what you have does not belong to you. This is a theme all throughout the scripture. Right now, 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. Same thing said a different way, different context. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. It says, for Christ's love compels us, Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should what? No longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The problem with an earner mentality is that, again, it takes God out of the equation in the receiving of resources and also in the uses of resources. But a kingdom mentality sees God as the provider of both. It's God who provides, and it's also God who should be directing me in how I should be using these resources. In the parable, the man made no mention of God whatsoever. No acknowledgement, no consideration, no honoring, no no, no God whatsoever, and God was displeased with that because he likes to be the center of all things because he is in the center of all things. And for us to, to, to live according to our identity, we have to have the same mindset that it's God who provides, and God should be the one guiding us in how we use our resources. Now, there has to have some balance here. There's two extremes to avoid. One extreme is this, that I'm supposed to live life with as minimal as possible. I'm not supposed to save any money. I'm supposed to give everything I have away because that's what holiness looks like. That's not holiness. That's mis- misguided zeal. That's actually a works-based form of holiness. It's not what God has for us. But on the other end of the spectrum, and this is the one that's more common in our culture, it's this mentality that I've already been saying. I have the right to do whatever I want with my money as long as it's not sin. I gave my whatever percent to the church, and the rest is for me to do with whatever I want. And I'm going to earn more resources, and I'm going to pad my life with as much comfort as I possibly can. And I'm going to earn more resources and get more comfort. I'm going to earn more resources and get a bigger house. 
I'm going to earn more resources and get an even bigger house, an even nicer car. And that, if you notice, that's the exact mentality of the guy in this parable. Literally. What I have is mine, and I'm going to use it solely for myself. No consideration of God whatsoever. It's not pleasing to God. It's not how it should be. A kingdom mentality says, God, I've received from you as a gift, and I'm going to steward it for your glory. Please guide me. Guide me, God, in how you want me to use these resources. Now, it's not inherently sinful to improve your quality of life. What matters is, did you consult God at all? That's the bigger question. Did you bring it to God in any act of surrender whatsoever? The key is relationship. That's what God wants. He wants relationship with you. It's not about being paralyzed with every decision that you have. But it's about being in an intimate connection with your father and having your decisions flow from that connection. God is interested in relationship, if you haven't noticed. This is what walking by the Spirit is all about. By having a connection with your father, maintaining intimacy with him, and everything from your life flowing from that connection. And resources are the same thing. Sometimes God may be fine with you improving your quality of life. And sometimes God may have given you that surplus to bless someone else with. It's not yours. It's him. God, here it is. Take it. Use it for your glory. Now, we've been talking a lot about not living in fear, trusting in God to provide, him being our provider, all good. Here's the next question, though. Okay, what is our part in God's provision? Do we just sit back and wait for God to provide? Or do we work? But if we work, how do we know we're not trusting in ourselves? Like, what is... What is our part in receiving God's provision? That's what we're going to start unpacking next week. But for this week, there's a few things I want to encourage you to do for for soul work. Here's the first question to consider and to sort of unpack with God. Number one, is there anything that you feel led to do by God, but you're afraid that you won't have enough? Start identifying is this core belief in your mindset. Anything that you're not doing that you think God is leading you to, but you're not doing it because you don't think you're going to have enough, whether it's money, whether it's energy, whether it's capacity, whether it's relationships. God, is there any way that I'm not obeying because I don't think I I have enough? I'm not saying you do it. I'm not saying be flippant, but I'm saying let's start identifying these thought patterns in our minds. It's the first step. Start identifying it. Second thing to consider, is there any way in which I'm not resting in God's provision? Is there any way in which I'm trying to control a situation? I'm not surrendering. Have I done my part? God hasn't provided, but I'm still trying to force it to happen. Is there any way in which you're starting to become like Abraham and Sarah? Something to consider for soul work. Am I believing I won't have enough? Am I not resting in God's provision? And the third one to consider, is there any way in which you have become an owner instead of a manager? You've become an owner instead of a steward. Is there any area of your life, it could be finances, could be relationships, could be time. All this belongs to God. Is there any way that in which God is no longer having influence in your life? Should he bring it up? Should he reveal that to you? It's time to re-surrender that to him. And nothing might not even change. Things may stay the same, but at least he's at the center of it now. At least he's being considered. At least there's a relationship now that's being cultivated. That's what life in the spirit is all about. So when we understand who our father is and who we are, we will walk more in alignment with our identity. So hopefully this week, may we grow in our understanding of who our father is so that we can grow in the realities that should be experienced by us as his children. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for allowing us to be your children. What a privilege. What a privilege. Father, we acknowledge that becoming your child only comes by grace through faith in Christ. Becoming your child does not happen by working harder or by going to church or by reciting Hail Marys or by living in a home where we went to Catholic school or Christian school. That is not how we become your child. We become your child through surrender, through trusting in in your son, Christ, through believing that we're separated from you because of our sin and believing that nothing can fix that. But in your love, you sent Christ to the cross to pay the debt that our sin deserved 
so that if we would believe in Jesus, if we would surrender, surrender our life, cry out to him for forgiveness, you would wash our sin away. We might be reconciled back to you and become your children and learn how to live that out. Father, if there's anyone in here who is deceived, who is not your child, would you please awaken them to this? And would you please also quicken them to realize you love them. You've made provision for them to become your child. May they receive that provision through faith in Christ and express it through baptism. And for us who are your children, please let us walk in this. Help us understand who we are and who you are and the reality that should flow in our life. If there's any of us who are bogged down by fear, whether it's fear of getting hurt or fear of dying or fear of not having enough, uh, please help us to renew our minds with the truth. You're our provider. You always provide for your stuff. We need to just be faithful. And also for any of us who have been using our stuff, our time, our whatever, as if it's ours and not yours, we repent of that. Help us to come into proper alignment to realize it's your stuff. And yes, yeah, some of it might be for us and some of it might be for others. But we just need to surrender to you and seek your guidance in all these things. We want to live like children of God. Please help us this week. It's in Christ and we pray. Everybody sit together.